Hey friends, welcome back to the channel and to another episode of Mealtime Mondays, where today we are joined by Gordon. Gordon is the videographer on our team. That was a bit of a weird wave, I think. A bit of a weird wave. Yeah, it looks a bit, it's, a bit, it's a bit odd. <laughs> but we're going to be eating some sushi while I'm going to grill Gordon um, and ask him questions about stuff. So Gordon, when people ask you, what do you do these days? How do you describe? What's, what's your answer? Is this someone who knows me or someone who doesn't know me? No, someone who doesn't know you. Like, you're, you're meeting a little gal down the Leica shop and they're like, oh, what do you do? Okay, maybe not the Leica shop, maybe like the local Aldi. Sorry, the local waitress. I know what? you're a classy guy. <laughs> what do I do? That's yeah. a good question. What do you do? Uh, I probably start with I work with a YouTuber or work for a YouTuber mm. because that tends to like lead to questions, you know? Yeah. And then they'll be like, oh, well, what do you mean you work for a YouTuber? I'm like, well, I help him make his videos. I take pictures of him. I edit things. That's probably what I say. Okay. Like, I don't really know how to describe it because it's kind of like I'm a videographer, but then I also take pictures and I also do editing. Yeah. And the whole classic idea of media has now moved away from the camera operator, colorist, editor, sound guy. It's now like the creator economy is people who do all of the stuff now. Like they, they had to dabble into pretty much everything. Yeah. Whereas like a traditional camera operator just wouldn't, he wouldn't do any coloring or editing. It'd just be work the thing. Yeah. So like when, when you say you work for a YouTuber, you, you, you work with a YouTuber, what sort of questions do people have? At that point, like, is that a rogue thing these days, or are people like, oh, okay, that makes sense? Uh, it's still pretty rogue, especially mm. if you're like, pushing someone over thirty or forty. They're mm. like, well, what do you mean you work for a YouTuber? Mm. Like, is there mo is there money in YouTube? I'm like, yeah, yeah, watch <laughs> watch this video. <laughs> <laughs> So it tends to be around that. They don't really know what to ask because they don't really know what it means. Yeah. You know, what do you mean you work for a YouTuber? Like, what is, what is, some of them might not even watch YouTube. So, because mm. I'm quite old. You're quite old. How old are you? 34. 34? Mm. My goodness. Shut and you, up. and you got a wife and a kid. Uh -huh. Incredible. Shit. So why did you decide you wanted to work for a YouTuber? How did, how did, how did, how did, how did we get here? Well. What was the journey in the Gordon Greenhorn life? Um, I'm not working for any YouTuber. Very good. <laughs> like back in the day, I used to work as a personal trainer. Oh, how'd you get into that? Uh, <laughs> it's funny you're asking me these questions because you know the answer to these uh, questions. I know, but like I'm curious. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so I got into personal training because I left school, didn't really know what I wanted to do. Uh, ended up working in hospitality, uh, managing restaurants and running yep. weddings and stuff. Yeah. As a teenager. And then... Wait, manage, managing restaurants? Yeah, I was like... You managed a restaurant? 18, 19, yeah. Bloody hell. How do you end up managing a restaurant at 18, 19? Uh, Isn't that like a thing that you need to be in your 40s to do? <laughs> Probably. Right. But I don't know, I just... You hustle? Uh, maybe, yeah. Maybe I was just good at what I did. Okay. Or they didn't have anyone else to do it. It's one, one or the other. Got it. You can decide. Fair enough. <laughs> so you're managing restaurants at 18, 19. Mm -hmm. And then... I'm, I'm like exercising and training at that time. Because I left school, I played football until I was about 17. Okay. Okay, what do you mean you played football until you were 17? Yeah, I played football. Like professionally? No. No. Just like kicked a ball down the road? <laughs> no. I played, for, <laughs> okay. I played for a football team. Okay. Oh, like a school team or like an actual team? Like a team, yeah. For like, since I was three. No way. Until I was about 17. Oh, we should totally do five-a-side football. Yeah. That would be so fun. There's the, like a place down the road. Whoops. I'd like to see you play football. Mm. I'm not very good. You're not very good. Mm. Ah, got you. Mm. Mm. But um, the problem was when I started to get into work, I was renting, like I left home at 18. Yeah. So I was renting somewhere. Yeah. And one of the things that I thought about was if I play football, I might get injured. Okay. And then I can't pay the rent, mm. which is a bit of a problem. Mm. So I decided that I wanted to still keep fit, so I'd go to the gym. Mm. And I was going to the gym since I was about 15 anyway, but I probably took it a bit more seriously as I got a bit older, 19, 20. Okay. And then I watched this BBC documentary called Baby Faced Bodybuilders. Baby Faced Bodybuilders. Yeah, it's on Love BBC it. Three. I think okay. It's still there. It's actually there's if anyone's interested, if you go on YouTube and type in rice and a fish cake, there's a guy on there, it's quite quite amusing, where mm. he talks through your, his diet okay. for his bodybuilding competition. Yeah. And he just goes he just talks through meal one is fish, mm. meal two is fish and a rice cake. Mm. Meal three is fish. Yeah. <laughs> Four is fish and a rice cake. Eight o'clock in the morning, I'll have fish and a rice cake. Oh, incredible. But the quite entertaining part of this is he forgets what meal he's having for his next one. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you go and watch it. It's very funny. Mm. Um, but it got me interested where I was like, hmm, what's bodybuilding? Now I sort of discovered it's all about drugs and whatever else. And I was like, well, I don't want to take drugs. Okay. So how am I going to do this? Okay. So then I found out about natural bodybuilding. Mm. Uh, I did that. Was pretty did all right. I'd competed at it, and then um, I ended up getting found out because I won. I won one of the competitions. Oh, which competition did you win? 
Junior Natural Mr. Scotland. Junior Natural Mr. Scotland. That's right. JNMS. Yeah. If you, nice. go, if you Google me, there's probably plenty of pictures of oh. me in my pants. We'll put, we'll put some photos up here of what Gordon used to look like back in like 2009, was it? 2010? Mm. 2011? 2008 was the first competition I did. Okay. Junior Natural Mr. Scotland. That's right. Okay. Um, so I did that, and the gym manager mm. at the time, shout out Steve Bradley, yeah. he wanted, they asked me to be on that their newsletter because it was like quite a cool thing, mm. apparently. So they sat down, they chatted to me about it, they put me in their newsletter. Yeah. And then Steve wanted to talk to me more about this whole like bodybuilding and training and blah, 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 to help yeah. his stuff out. So we sat down and talked about it. Yeah. And then he was like, have you ever considered personal training? Cool. Oh, and I was like, hmm. And at the time I was like working as a, I was managing a restaurant at the time. Okay. And how old were you at the time? Mm, 21, okay. maybe 20, something like that. So the Steve fellas like, have you considered being a personal trainer? And at this point you've already gotten hench. Mm. Like super hench to win junior natural Mr. Scotland. Yep. Got it. So I did that. And he was like, look, we'll put you through your courses, get you to do your thing. Mm. Uh, come and work for us. What? And it was a Nuffield Health. Mm. Fancy. So I went to go and work for them. I went from, the, the funny part about that was, I went from a job that was kind of making me, I don't know, circa 20,000 a year, a bit of tips and things like that. And it was, it was okay. You know, I could pay my rent, do mm. my thing, mm. enjoy life to a certain degree. But then, <clears throat> gym instructors, I don't think the gym, I don't think a gym instructor exists anymore. I think mean, you just get free personal trainers who do gym instructing roles. Right. So gym instructor would like clean equipment, look after equipment, whatever else. So I had to take that job first yeah. because personal training was kind of like gig economy type of zero hour contract. Mm. You get, you you uh, you catch what you can eat sort of jobby. Right. And uh, I went from a job at 20,000 to 11,500. Okay, so you could t- took a 50% pay cut. <laughs> yes, oh, to, wow. to become a personal trainer. I didn't realize that was legal. I'd, yeah, I mean, bear in mind my rent was five hundred pounds a month, five twenty-five. I think oh. it was. So uh, more than half your salary is going on rent. <laughs> easily, like nice. my, my my net my net take home was nine hundred pounds a month. Okay, <laughs> so that was quite hard. Of which five hundred is like rent, probably mm. some council taxes, a mm. thing, bills, and yep. damn. So the first three months were pretty hard. Okay. Um, why why did you decide to do that rather than your like you were earning twice as much? managing a restaurant, mm. why would you take a 50% pay cut? That seems a bit weird. Probably ignorance a little bit. Like, I didn't really think about it. Mm. I didn't think of it, oh, I'm going to take a 50% pay cut because I'm like 20 years old. You well, know? and you couldn't figure out like 20 divided by 11 is about 50%. <laughs> or like, what was that? I guess I could. <laughs> what do you mean you didn't think about it? I, no, but I didn't really think about it because I was just like, I want to do this thing. Okay. So. Oh, so you were following your passion kind of. Absolutely. Is that fair to say? Oh, okay. yeah. So I, you enjoyed the training thing. You wanted I to love, have other I love people I love fitness, love training, love doing the thing. I didn't really okay. see hospitality as a future um, endeavor because oh. the more I got entrenched in it, the more I'm just going to be doing till two o'clock in the morning, yeah. working seven days a week, you know, 16, 18 hour days. Okay. And I was like, this is not going to work. So it sounds like you were intrinsically motivated, shall we say, to do the personal training thing, even though the money was a lot worse mm. because you just actually enjoyed it or you enjoyed kind of the idea of being in that industry because you were... Very much so, yeah. Hedged. Definitely definitely looked at it and thought, this is, this is something I'd like to do. Mm. I remember my girlfriend at the time just being like, you're mad, like, what are you doing? She was more of the, the person that was in my head saying, this is a silly idea, it's 50% pay cut. Mm. <laughs> like, how are you going to do this? It's just a... Yeah, she was doing the math. It's not a real job. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. And so, where was I going with that story? Yeah, so I did the personal training thing. Yep. Did that for two and a half years in Aberdeen, did pretty well at it, moved to London. Worked okay, for- so when you say did pretty well, do you mean you were still earning 11K or like what was, what? how did things progress? Uh, so I think my biggest paycheck, I can't remember exactly how much I earned. You didn't earn much, like £13 an hour, but it was more obviously than... 11,500. So you said that things were going well after about two and a half years in Aberdeen, mm-hmm. and so you decided to move to London. Yeah. So How um, did you decide to move to London? Well, it was kind of the, the thing that was happening in Aberdeen was it, it, it seemed to be going really well, or it, what it appeared to be anyway. Because I get invited down to like meet the directors at Nuffield and talk about how they can improve personal training, and I was like out selling. I was like the number one personal trainer in Aberdeen for selling personal training sessions within the gym, but then also when comparing to like the rest yeah. of the Nuffields that were out there, I was like, at least top three oh, yeah. amount of sessions I was delivering. So it was going well, and then I was kind of like, question. Ooh. How did you get so good at delivering personal, selling and delivering personal training? And what were the principles that, looking back, you applied that your peers at the time didn't to make you better than everyone else? So the first thing is I looked like I knew what I was doing. Okay, see so you bench. Which kind, of, which kind of helps. Okay. Um, the second thing was I took the idea that prospective clients yep. are... Like, this was a time when there wasn't sort of, Facebook, there wasn't Instagram, there wasn't really like any TripAdvisor or review sites or Google even kind of didn't really do review things. Okay. So I largely kind of looked at it like your, I'm trying to use the exact quote that I used for a presentation I did, which was the gym is your stage and your personal training session is your performance. 
Hmm. So when you're, when I was delivering a like session for you or for the client, for prospective clients, because yeah. they're watching me like acting out this personal training session. I see. So and you're performing. So I'm performing, yeah. and that's my stage. And yeah. you know, ultimately, delivering a good personal training session is being engaging. It's talking to them. It's not just sat down on your phone. Like, yeah. like none of that works. Yeah. Especially if you want to motivate the clients in front of you, but also if you want to get prospective clients. Recognizing that was ultimately, I'm selling without selling. So mm. I'm using my body language. I'm oh. talking to my client. So if, for example, you're doing a session with me and then Jamie's chilling over there, he's going to be like, oh, I wonder what's happening in that session. Yeah, this looks fun. This looks engaging. This looks oh. interesting. And is then, that why my personal trainer, Martin, is all big, big on like shouting? And I always feel a bit like, like oh, could right. be. Yeah. Could be because the, but that's also like, also personal trainers are making up for the fact that, or they, that's with, no, personal trainers think that they sell, their currency is blood, sweat and tears. Okay. So that's how, every session, because most clients don't get incredible results. Oh, okay. And by making a client feel tired, sweaty, yep. makes them feel like they've spent like they've spent their money well. Mm. Okay. It's like, oh, I had a really good session, I'm sweating. Mm. You know, it feels like they can't do that themselves. Mm. So I think personal trainers feel like they have to do that, which you don't really, but. So I guess there's part of that, you know? I, I set up a, a largely a framework for most general population clients was they'd have a strength section, so they'd have uh, a push and pull exercise. They then have like a pump session or something that might be specific to them where they're like, I want bigger arms. And then you'd have like a finisher. And that finisher would be something that would get them hot, sweaty, and tired okay. and challenging. <laughs> yeah, battle ropes and yep. all sorts of bits and pieces. Okay. Um, so I guess that's kind of led it to that. And right. I was just super committed. Mm. You know, if a client was like, hey, Gordon, can you train me at 9 p.m.? Yeah, mm. sure, I'll be there right. on a Sunday. You know. <laughs> Do you go, hey Gordon, do you want to come to this wedding fair to sell personal training sessions to potential brides to help sell memberships? Yeah, sure, I'll be there. Like, yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll do whatever it takes mm. to be the best personal trainer. I'd go on loads of courses. Like every week I was doing a new course. I was investing all my money that, <laughs> of all the money that I was making, I was trying to buy new courses, buy new books, read blogs. Like it was, it just, I was engrossed. I didn't go on holiday for three and a half years. Couldn't afford it, but. Mm. If you had your time again, is that how you would do it? Because a lot of people talk these days about the whole oh anti-hustle movement and hustle bad and like work-life balance and stuff. But I think when you're young and like you're trying to quote make it, mm. then I don't know. At least for that season of life, sometimes you do just you're in kind of quote hustle mood. And I think as long as you're having fun and living your best life, then then it's all good. And as long as it's not like a permanent thing, but it's like a temporary thing to get somewhere and then you can start being a bit more balanced about it. What do you, what do you think? This is going to sound a bit patronizing and it's something that I didn't realize when I was, when I was that young. Yeah. And I'm glad I did it. Was fundamentally you have so much free time. You have so much time. You have so much energy for things. You have so much, you may not have necessarily resources, but you certainly have yourself to be able to lean on and to be able to work hard with. Yep. And then when you turn like, I'm 34, pushing 35 now, I have a kid, I have a wife, I have responsibilities, I have mortgages, I have all sorts of things that I have to, I have responsibilities for. And that slows down my considerations, it creates a bit more friction, but in good ways, like there's still really nice things to have and to mm. do, but you don't have them when you're like 20. <laughs> right. You know, and I think if you don't, you should be working hard and playing hard at the same time. Like just honestly, try everything, do everything, yeah. you know, sleep less, say yes to so many different types of things. And sure the hustle mentality is maybe pushed a little bit too much, mm. but at the same time, you know, I think you can only really win the game if you're playing it. Okay, what about upping out of the game altogether? Would you have been happy being a sort of 20K a year with a good work-life balance, still in Aberdeen, rather than moving to London, hustling the big city, et cetera, et cetera? Sure. maybe when I'm like 50. Mm. Like not not when I'm twenty. Okay. Um, so you were kind of going after more of something. Mm, I just what? think I want to be the best at what I was doing. Okay. I couldn't really do that in Aberdeen. Sure. So I had to I had to move to London. I applied for a job at I think I think they classified themselves at the time the number one personal training studio in Europe. Oh, so okay. yeah. And uh, yeah, so I basically moved from Aberdeen, northeast of Scotland, to London. I'd only ever been there once, I think, before, and I was when I was eleven. Hmm. I moved when I was twenty four. Hmm. And it was the same kind of mentality, but it was really interesting because I went from what I think I described myself as a big fish in a small pond yep. to then a small fish <laughs> in a big pond. Yep. And it also changed because I was in a gym, Nuffield Health is kind of like a lifestyle-y type of gym and most personal trainers don't care too much. They, don't, they, don't, they don't, didn't really kind of engage with as much as I think I felt I did. Yeah. But then I went into a gym and worked in a gym where every single personal trainer cared 
and they worked as hard as you did. It was like you know jumping into the sh- the, the pit of sh- like sharks everywhere, and they're all just like wanting to work, work really hard and do everything as hard as they possibly can. And you know, it's, it's very competitive. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, that was an experience. I think is the words I'll use on that. All right. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. I want to go into too many details. Oh, on that one. <laughs> hello. Interesting. Okay, so you moved to London at the age of 24. You joined this gym, which was like the best gym in Europe or whatever, and you were surrounded by these ultra hustle bros and sisses. Yep. And what happened next in the Gordon Greenhorn life? One of one of the things that happened was, and this kind of this kind of happened at previous jobs where you know you, you weren't. This sounds selfish, but screw it. You don't feel like you're kind of supported or looked after or you know, nurtured in a sense. You just kind of, you you get a percentage, for example, that you're earning, and then yeah. you just kind of, you go home and yeah. there will be no consideration like, hey, we'll pay for this course for you, or we'll buy this new equipment, or mm. whatever else. Yeah. So I was just kind of a bit sick and tired of that, and then I asked for a pay rise, and then get the pay rise. I was mm. like, you know what? I can do this on my own. The relationship with the clients, the business is the business, the business isn't really helping me, you know, I, why don't I just do this on my own? Mm. So I just decided to go freelance. Yep. And from 18 months in London to going totally freelance on myself, uh, I then worked freelance for oh, three and a half, four years. Oh, okay. So self-promotion, yeah. social media was starting to kick off then. Yep. This was around about 2012. Yep. And even in 2012, so Facebook was big, Instagram didn't exist. Mm. So then I was also like, mm, you know what? Having clients pay me in block sessions, yep. this isn't very safe. Okay. Because I'd get paid for 20, 50, 100 sessions, yep. which was good for cash flow, but then you've got to budget for it a little bit, not just like spend it all yep. and you know be a bit more kind of like balanced in what you're doing. Mm. But equally, by the time you finish those 50 sessions, you're like, hmm, are they going to buy 50 more yeah. or is that it? Yeah. And I was like, oh, this online thing seems quite interesting. So one of my friends, shout out Scott Bapti, he started a Lean Files blog where he was talking about getting lean and whatever else. And, and he kind of, I got talking to him about this whole online thing or Facebook. And yeah. he was like, hey, you need to put, start posting, posting, posting. I'm like, cool, okay. Oh, so like uh, Gary Vee style posting content kind yeah, of like. Yeah, 100%. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. So then I'd post three times a day and I did that for the best part of like three and a half years. On Facebook? On Facebook, yeah. Oh, what were you posting? Just health and lifestyle tips and stuff. Oh, nice. So I was kind of like, the way I was doing it was I was po- talk, posting about things I was angry about when I was like 16. Okay. So it was supplements that didn't really work, it was kind of dispelling myths, it mm. was looking at research, it was trying to be trying to be an evidence-based personal trainer. And So did you have like a Gordon Greenhorn Facebook page at the time? Yeah. Oh, and you were posting on your Facebook page? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. at the time, Facebook had oh. large amounts of organic reach and stuff, so... Loads! Those oh my, unbelievable. Would, view, would have been getting lots of views. Kind of like LinkedIn today, apparently. Mm. Well, what, turned to ha- what happened there was people were like, hey, can you write me training programs? Mm. Can you help me with my diet advice? Yep. So that was a kind of the birth for me of online personal training like we know it now. Yep. Where I would just take Apple Notes and write out training programs and I'd do diet plans and macros and all that kind of stuff. And then that sort of evolved into nice sexy looking spreadsheets and mm. Skype calls and WhatsApp and all those kind of like little systemy things that turned into it. And so I had my block bookings that I'd have for my one-to-one personal training clients, but then my online would turn into like a direct debit model. So I'd have like, that would be my salary. And then if I needed to purchase anything or go in big courses or do anything, then I'd have like pretty good cash flow from, right. from clients. And so how much were you making annually when you first moved to London? And how did that change over the next few years, if you're comfortable sharing? Uh, that was about like, 10 years ago, so it's probably... Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so when I was contracting in a gym, mm. probably moved 40. 40K a year. Yep. Pounds. So about 50K dollars. Okay. Yep, 40, 50,000 um, dollars. And then when it went freelance, it jumped a lot. Okay. So then when I started freelancing, you know, so basically the model was you would uh, get, say, 39% from the the amount that the client was paying to this gym. Yeah. And that would be it. So you'd get quite a lot. It was okay. But then suddenly now I'm getting 100% from yeah. whatever clients that I got at the time when I was freelancing. Okay. So you're getting a 2.5x increase. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. So you're on roughly 100k a year from just your one-on-one clients. Nearly, yes. And then you add in like the online clients. Yes. What is what do the economics of being an online personal trainer look like? Like what is that? Like if I wanted to be an online personal trainer, yeah. how much can I charge? What like how does how does it work? So you you could charge now it's, you're probably charging about two hundred pounds per month, give or take. Okay. For a for a pretty good, you know, relatively high standard online coaching experience. I see. Um, and could, is that just like meal a sort of meal plans and training plans, or is that like hopping on a Zoom call every week with them to be like, let's work out together? Yeah, so this the style has changed in a sense that 
for me, it was never about personal training a client one to one over Skype, yeah. where a lot of people thought that was. Yeah. So I I didn't do that. Mm. It was just I'd write their macros. They'll have uh, maybe like an example meal plan because there's also some litigious issues with the idea of dietetics and um, meal plans. Like oh. normal people like me or you can't just give someone a meal plan because it's prescriptive. Okay. Because they might die of something or oh, whatever right. else. But I could take their macros. They got 200 grams of protein. I'd be like, this is how I would eat to get those macros. Got it. And that's how you get, kind of get around it. Okay. So I'd do that for them. Uh, I also then recognized that attrition rates were lower when I had more contact. So they'd have check-in days and then they'd have like once a month Skype calls. Yep. So that's how it kind of evolved. Now we have some personal trainers that might do things like Loom conversations. So they'll yep. have a client record a Loom um, video about their check-in. So Loom.com forward slash Ali. <laughs> Link in video description. So they'll talk about their like Good wins. Like yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's very good. It's very professional. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah. they do their little, record their Loom sort of uh, check-in thing, yep. and then they'd have set check-in days with clients and whatever else, and they'd have like more complicated spreadsheets and exercise libraries and all sorts of stuff. So from an economy perspective, I mean, I've got, I've got, I, I was, you know, working in the videographer creative space with some fitness fitness people who were big in coaching. Yeah. I mean, they're doing two hundred and fifty k a year. Oh wow! So if I wanted to be an online personal trainer. I need to get the approach of some level of quali qualification, some level of finding clients. And then yep. at that point, I can check in with them once a month on a Zoom call. Yep. And they send me their workout plans and I give them workout plans. Yep. And I can charge 200 quid per month per client. Yep. And how many clients can a online personal trainer feasibly manage if it's a full-time gig? 50. 50? Mm -hmm. So I could be making, what's 50 times 200? 100. Bloody hell. I could be making 100k a month. Mm, no, no. you're right. 10K, 10, 10K. 200 times 50 is like 1,000 times 10, which is 10K. I can make 10K a month yep. off of 50 clients paying me 200 quid a month. Yep. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. It's not bad. Yeah. Okay. So you did that for some years. And yeah. then how did you get into the videography stuff? Well, the whole the whole game of the online thing yeah. was self-promotion. Okay. So I um, I just started to get like play with cameras and play with uh, making videos and editing software. And it just was enjoyable. I just I thought it was a really fun part of marketing. And I also felt like, so there was a couple of different things that were happening in the, the sphere of social media. Instagram kicked in a little bit. Facebook was starting to push more push videos to a certain degree. Uh, the evidence-based movement within fitness started to happen because there was more access to the people across the country, across the world. So inevitably things improve because knowledge is being shared better, etc. Yep. But what was happening was people were like just arguing over the nuances of like muscle protein synthesis and yep. uh, moment arms and all sorts yep. of bits and pieces. And you're like, like general general population don't <laughs> give two hoots about that too much. Yep. They just want to know, does this chicken breast contain enough protein for me to be able to gain muscle mass? Yes. <laughs> and I was like, right, rather than telling people, why not show them? So I decided that I was watching Casey Neistat at the time. He was kind of big in vlogging. I was like, I'm going to do that, but for fitness. Okay. So I went to New York, uh, ended up taking my mom to New York for her birthday, went to B&H, bought the silly dildo looking tripody thing. Am I allowed to say, I allowed to say that? That's all good. Yeah. Weird looking tripody thing. Uh, Canon 80D microphone, just oh, the Casey setup. The Casey, set the the Casey setup. Up. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. So. That's what I did. So I daily vlogged a natural bodybuilding contest prep for 210 days straight. 210 days? Yeah. Bloody hell. So what were, and at the same time you were doing like personal training online and one-on-one. -on -one. So I swear. And I, preparing for a natural bodybuilding competition and vlogging it every single day. Yes, and editing myself and yeah. So <laughs> so I'd have, this is when, when we talked about the idea of like a 20 year old, right? You should, you should just like go ham. Yeah. Like work hard, work weekends, mm. play hard, like just do what you can do to experience as many different things as you possibly can. Mm. Uh, build businesses, fail at them, just do whatever you can. And this was kind of one of those things where I look back on it and think, oh, holy crap. I, I, I slept four or five hours a day for six, seven months. I was managing 50 online clients, 55 online clients, give or take. I was doing 30 odd hours, one-to-one -one PT. I had a girlfriend at the time. I was daily vlogging, so I'd get up, film myself all day, get home at 9, 10 p.m. at night, edit for two or three hours, go mm. to bed at, say, midnight, one o'clock, get up at four, five o'clock in the morning, and do that every day. Maybe you gotta get a line on, like, a Sunday. Damn. And I did that for like six months. Okay. And how was that? Uh, there were things that happened. It was weird, like physical things that started happening. Like I was getting like really weird eye twitches mm. from super high stress. And I might feel like dizzy or I might have like slept in the gym a few times. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. 
if you, if you had your time again, would you do the same thing? Mm. Like if there's a 26 year old watching this now and they're like, bloody hell, this guy worked hard. Like, would, would, I, would I do it again? Would you recommend it? <laughs> like the funny thing was the videos didn't really get that much traction. Mm. You know, if we consider your stats, for example, you know, you're doing 200K give or take views per video mm. at least. And the whole Facebook thing, it wasn't really geared for videos because that's where I was posting these daily vlogs was on Facebook. Oh, yeah. it wasn't, it, they get posted to YouTube, but again, they wouldn't get any traction because A, the thumbnails were crap. Yeah. Like the titles were just like day one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know, and you know, so it didn't really get that many traction. I don't think YouTube is that big as it is now or common as it is now. So, you know, would I would I tell myself that I would do it again? Is that a question you're asking me, like, what would I change maybe? Or is you're literally asking me, as in, if I you, again? So I, I, I guess connecting the dots looking backwards, do you think that that was a good thing to have done, even sort of given given the way things turned out? Mm. Or if you if you had a if you had a do over, what would you have done differently, I guess? Sure. Would I have done it again? If I didn't have the hindsight, probably yes. Mm. Because it was it was hard. And it was not just hard on me, it was like hard on my wife Laura. Because she just saw me I was just like a I was a melt of a man. Mm. Because I just I was so tired, I had no time for her. Yep. Um I was very and especially with the bodybuilding thing where you're starving yourself at the same time, it's effectively like starvation. Mm. So that has its psychological issues that come with that. And it's just, it's all consuming. Like it, my whole life, I, I remember finishing this vlogging thing and kind of stopping. I don't know why I stopped, but I did. And I remember walking around thinking like, where's the camera? <laughs> Cause it's quite a big piece of kit to carry around with you. And I, I just, I'd always have like these, like, where is it? Like what's going on? And I have all those weird things happening. Okay. Um, so I would say if I didn't necessarily have the hindsight to how hard it was, I would absolutely do it again. Okay. And again as well, even though I have the hindsight now, I still look back and think that had to be one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. Hmm. was to daily vlog because not only do I have the memories that I've, I've like captured every single day of 210 days like I don't know how many human beings on the planet have been able to do that hmm. I also learned the skills that inevitably land me here because it accelerates things pretty quickly if you're making something every single day and you're almost like like Casey called it he wanted to make movies every day yeah so you get kind of like you get good at that pretty quickly and then just yeah just it kept going and kept going getting deeper down the rabbit hole hmm. um, made more videos you know because when I finished the prep thing I went traveling so I made travel videos um, yeah okay interesting so I feel like that's a good place to end this we can do a <laughs> Gordon Greenhorn part two of the story which is sort of what what happened post mm. daily vlogging and how we ended up sitting yeah. here together yeah we'll save that for another, uh, another episode of Mealtime Mondays any ask or request or piece of advice for the audience if they've watched this far? What would I say a piece of advice? Like be brave. Be brave. Yeah. I like it. It's good stuff. All right. Here is a little playlist of other Mealtime Mondays if you're interested in checking it out. Thank you for watching. Do subscribe to the channel for more behind the scenes type stuff into like what we do here. Uh, thanks for watching. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.